Hey guys, let's do this thing. Um, so I'm here to talk about marketing your indie game and how to not suck at it. Uh, so who the heck am I? My name is Quasi. I make indie games full time, and I made this stuff. Uh, one game is called Shopping Farmers, the other one's called Skyhook. One of these games sold really well, the other one didn't. One of these games are marketed decently, and the other one wasn't. You can imagine which one sold better. Um, so, uh, disclaimer, my talk might seem a little mean, I don't really care, I'm just being honest. This is what worked for me, your mileage may vary. If you don't put in the work on the things I talk about, then you can't expect results. Um, this talk applies to people creating commercial PC games. The advice is probably applicable to tabletop games and console games, but I've never tested them, I've never tested them on PC games, so I'm sorry if I'm not. Uh, and I'm assuming you made games to make money. You can do it for art, that's amazing, I respect it, but I will become homeless if the games don't sell, so I'm going to talk a lot about making money uh, and marketing games. Uh, so, uh, let's get this out of the way really quick. Uh, you need a strong hook in your game. I'm sure a lot of you guys in this room know that, but I wanted to make sure I said it in a marketing talk because it would be bad if I did it. Um, and by hook, I mean what your game is about, what makes your game unique, what makes it different from the tens of thousands of indie games coming out every month or year it is now. Um, so your game needs a strong hook to be successful. Your marketing, all the stuff we're going to talk about today won't work unless your game has a hook. Your game can't just be a 2D platformer. It has to be a Dark Souls 2D platformer like Hollow Knight was, or a um, super NES specific 2D platform like Shop Shop, etc. It has to have something unique about it that's going to make it different from all the other indie games in your genre that are going to be similar. Um, and once you have that hook, you need to be able to pitch that hook to me and someone else in 11 words or less. Something really succinct and simple that makes me turn my head because there's plenty of other people making a game just like the game you're thinking of making, even if you feel like your game is super unique. Uh, you have to make sure you know how to present your game in that unique way so it makes someone turn their head because they're getting flooded with lots of indie games every day. Uh, the hook isn't strong, then the rest of the stuff won't work. Um, so, nobody cares. Nobody is listening. We're going to be talking about that a lot today. This is what I see happen over and over and over to indie developers, and it happened to me, is you work on your game for months, for years, usually for multiple years, and you love it, and you work so hard on it, and you're so proud of it, and you get it on Steam, and you hit that launch button, and you're like, I did it! I made a game, I'm so proud of myself, but guess what? Nobody cares, and your game does matter. Uh, and the reason nobody cares is because you don't have an audience. Now, if you don't have an audience when your game comes out, uh, then it's going to do poorly, which is why we're seeing the quote-unquote indie apocalypse. So many indies, it's getting easier and easier to make games, it's getting easier and easier to then put your game for sale without marketing it first. Um, so the only way people are going to care about your game is if you build an audience first. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about building an audience so that someone does actually care when your game comes out. Because I guarantee you, if people don't care right now about your indie game, they're not going to care when it comes out on Steam or Xbox. Um, so you need an audience if you expect anyone to care about your game, and you need to fix this before your game comes out. Not the month before your game comes out, not the week before your game comes out, and definitely not the week, the day your game is coming out. Uh, you can't expect people to start caring about your game when you're finally done working on it. Uh, you want to get, get them caring about your game way before it comes out. Um, people, talk a lot, like, people talk a lot about Stardew Valley, like it was an overnight success, like it just came out of nowhere and blew the you know, waters away and everybody was buying it and made millions of dollars. But Stardew Valley was building an audience for something like four years. He blogged about his development every single week. He grew fans who loved Harvest Moon games. When his game came out, he already had a beginning base of fans who wanted to buy the game. And that initial snowball helps build to a uh, huge success. Um, now, to actually grow an audience, uh, let's talk about not growing an audience for just your game, but actually growing an audience for you. So Blizzard is greater than Overwatch. Bethesda is greater than Fallout. Valve is greater than Half-Life 3. Uh, people are attached to these brands, these companies, not just their game. They do, of course, love the game too, but they are more attached to these companies, which is why their games continue to do well over and over and over. Now, we can't compete with these companies. We're never going to compete with Blizzard as, uh, as small teams or solo indie devs. But what we can compete with is, or, or the way we can compete is by being ourselves. Instead of branding your random indie company name that nobody knows about, you can brand yourself. How many indie studios can you name versus how many indie, famous indie developers can you name? What's Phil Fish's studio? I don't actually remember, but everybody here knows Phil Fish is, right? So we're going to talk about uh, getting people to uh, be invested in you as your, your, your game game company's brand as opposed to just your company. Uh, so I discovered this by accident by streaming my, my development on Twitch, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So that already fans of you is greater than fans of your game. Uh, and this also this is important because when your game is done, that's great, and now you're working on your next game, but guess what? If they're not fans of you, and they're just fans of your game, they're not going to move on to your next game. So you want to make sure they like you and know who you are, so if they want to see your first game, your second game, your third game, you continue to have successful games. Um, and so how do we actually do that? How do we get people to be invested in you and, and the games you're making? We take them behind the scenes. 
Uh, right now in the world of Instagram and vlogs and YouTube, people are obsessed with seeing how stuff is made, how bridges are built, how cooking is done, how restaurants run, and they also want to see how your game is made. Fans of your game are really interested in the behind the scenes process, uh, how you got to where you are, what you're doing, what, what changes you're making, and being able to voice their concerns uh, in how big the game should be. Um, so share your behind the scenes process, people are dying to see how it's done. Uh, and even if that means you only get 100 followers for sharing your behind the scenes process, that's 100 more people that care about your game than the zero would care about it if you didn't talk about your game at all before that. Um, so some things you can do, uh, one thing I choose to do is I stream my development on Twitch. Uh, I think a lot of people here know that. You can live stream your game uh, on things like Twitch, YouTube, and Mixer. If you're not a person who doesn't like to put yourself in front of a camera and live stream, that's not your only option. Uh, you can do lots of other things, uh, like create simply weekly dev logs. Uh, so this is an example on the right. Uh, this is a developer called Thin Matrix. So he's been working on this game, uh, Colonox, for I want to say two and a half years. And for two and a half years, every week he just posts a YouTube video where it wasn't like a fancy production. It was just him playing his game and talking about what he added that week. Uh, these are the bugs I fixed, these are the features I added, etc. For two and a half years, he made this content every week and built up a subscriber count, as you can see, 92,000. And so when his game of Colonox came out uh, two weeks ago, it immediately went on to sell a crap ton of units because he had that initial audience there. People were invested in his game, they wanted to come out, they were just surprised to see it come out. Um, so that's something really simple you can do right now if you're working on a game. You can just sit in front of your camera, turn on OBS. You don't have to put your camera, you don't have to put a, uh, your face on it if you're uncomfortable with that. And just talk about what you've been working on uh, and share it with a community that will slowly start growing. Um, what's great about creating on YouTube is that people search things on YouTube and they find it naturally and then they might discover your game that way. So once, it's on, once that video is on YouTube, there's a chance that one person every week might just discover your game. That's more than zero. Um, so I do this with Twitch streaming. I, I was lucky to get into Twitch streaming early. The, the, the environment's changed quite a bit now. You can still stream your game on Twitch, but I do also recommend uh, making videos on YouTube for it as well. Uh, if your game takes X years to make, don't waste those X years hiding in a cave and just toiling at your game, excited about the day that someone's going to find it. Spend those years also getting people to get excited about your game as you are, so that they're excited about it actually comes out. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you first. Yes? No? 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 Just a little bit. Just a little bit? Okay. Let's try not to go too long, but I'll slow down. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, okay. So when I talk about um, sharing your process and maybe streaming your content or making YouTube videos, I imagine the first thing a lot of people are thinking is, I have nothing to offer, right? Why would anybody watch me make my game? Uh, I don't have a fire personality or I'm not interesting or nobody likes me or whatever. Um, and everyone thinks they have nothing to offer, they're boring, and nobody wants to watch them. Nobody wants to watch them make their game. But the interesting thing about people who play games is a lot of them are interested in how it's made. People who are interested in how it's made also like buying games and also have friends who like to buy games. So they're already part of the audience right there. And if you think there's nothing, if you think you have nothing to offer in this regard, uh, you have your perspective. So every single person in here has their own story. Are you a single parent making video games? Do you have two kids and you have a full-time job and you're making video games? Do you, um, are you a college student who's making video games that people who are 30 years old can't even imagine making? Um, are you getting into the career earlier or later in everyone? Like you have your story that you can find be different from everybody else. And so people, your audience will um, attach to that story around you. And you might not know, story, know that story right now. You don't need to know it, just starting out. Uh, for me, streaming on Twitch, uh, my story became that I was a, a, a guy who was relatively fit, had a fake nose and a magical beard. That's the story that grew around my audience, and that's the, that's the story that's still attached to this day. And so you don't know what your story's going to be until you start uh, making some of this content. So find your perspective, and then you can roll with that. Um, all right, now let's talk about action items that you can actually do to market your game today. So I'm assuming most people know what Discord is, but if you don't, uh, Discord is one of the most popular kind of chat online hub services. It's essentially replaced forums. If you're on Slack, it's a lot like Slack, uh, but it's really, really targeted for the gaming community. So people use Discord to do voice chat, uh, to chat with each other, to hang out with their friends, etc. Uh, if you are making an indie game, I highly recommend starting a Discord server today. Like right now, take out your phone, sign up on Discord, set up the account. Not with your name, but with your game's name. So if your game is called like, you know, Dragon Slayer, make sure you make a Dragon Slayer Discord. Um, the whole point of Discord is it becomes a hub for your community. It's essentially like forums back in the day. It's a place for people who are interested in your game to get together, talk about the game, talk about things they're experiencing. Even if your game's not out, talking about things that they saw, getting to talk to you, getting to make suggestions about things they want in the game, uh, and really feeling invested in the development of the game. So they feel like they're a part of it. Um, these people become your mega fans. They, um, they uh, evangelize your game. They go out there and champion it. They tweet about it. They share it with their friends. 
uh, and they make sure that your game grows. So this is the, the number one thing you do right now is making sure you have an audience for your game when it comes out. Because the, even if there's only five people on your Discord, that's five people when your game comes out that are going to want to talk about it with their friends. Uh, so you can use Discord uh, to foster community about your game. Uh, this is an example of the Shotgun Farmers Discord where people come up with ideas for costumes and stuff and, and silly art, and I just go in there and I get to take them and put them into my game. So like this person drew a picture of the shop of the farmer in a um, flamingo floaty thing, and that's amazing, so I'm gonna put that in the game. Um, yeah, um, uh, so uh, it, it's a great place where you can go to get people to report bugs, so if they're playing your game, uh, when, you, when you exist on all, all of the social medias, on Twitter and Facebook, it's really hard for people to feel like they can use those things to communicate to you. Uh, but even more, it's hard for them to communicate with other people who have the game or who are interested in the game. And so this allows them to share stuff. So if, if your game hasn't come out yet, they can share ideas that they think would be good in the game or things they can speculate about watching trailers and, and photos of your game. Uh, and of course, they can share their fan art all in one place. It kind of helps this community start growing. And then if you make a Discord open, they can, each, they can join, they can invite their friends, and they can share that with their friends as well. Uh, uh, it's also a great place to make announcements or talk about changes, talk about if your game's out, talk about sales, talk about the day your game comes out, uh, Discord's announcement section. So people who are in your Discord will get a notification on their phone when you have news to share with them. So when my game has a new update on Steam, I let everybody on Discord know. When I stream, when I upload a new video, um, and when I make a vlog on YouTube, for example, I can share that with my Discord community. And now those people are now feeding your other social media. So your tweets, your Instagram posts, your YouTube videos can get likes and views from your Discord community and vice versa, so you can kind of cross-pollinate that way. Uh, super secret tip number one, uh, actually link to your Discord in the game. So if you have a demo for your game, have a link to your Discord, so you'll see it down there uh, in my main menu. Have a link to your Discord in the game, because as much as you think you're tweeting about your game, you're probably tweeting it to a lot of empty ears. Once you think you're, if you're, it's on your store page, if it's on the bumper sticker of your car, people might not even know it exists. So, uh, for the thousands of people who own Chakra Farmers, very small percent of them actually still know the Discord exists. So a good way I go around that is I put it in the main menu so that they can use that to just jump right into the, into the Discord. Because everyone who buys your game or finds your game or finds your demo online doesn't know you have a Twitter or doesn't care that you have a Facebook so they can know about it from inside of your game. So I highly recommend um, putting it in because remember, nobody's listening, so try to get them here. Uh, next thing, grow your email list. So I know email is kind of an obvious thing that everyone Everyone here gets newsletters, and we have a VGS newsletter, but a lot of people forget that email lists are really important to your own games. Um, and email lists is a great way to get people who want to hear about your game, who want to know updates and changes that are coming to your game. Um, uh, so if you don't have a website, make sure you have a website, and then put an email form uh, right in the front page, right on the landing page, either at the top, very top of your game as it come out, or somewhere in the middle or bottom if your game is out, after the bunny buttons. Um, and start gathering these emails as early as possible. Uh, every event you go to, every meetup you go to, every time you show your game, every person you show your game to, ask them if they want to sign up for your email list, show some, give them some kind of perk for doing it. I usually hand out like a button or a sticker, or I tell them they might get a free copy. Um, and get the email list because that is a customer base that you can grow. Emails, uh, like lots and lots of marketing studies have shown that email is still the place where people actually engage with stuff the most, more than social media and stuff, because it doesn't get lost as much in the feed. Um, so yeah, whenever you're showing your game, especially if you're showing it at a place like BGS, uh, if you're showing at like VGX, which happens once a year, uh, have a tablet or a paper form for people to sign up for, their, for your email list. And um, you can use a service like MailChimp to store that email list and then send out newsletters in mass. Um, and MailChimp is free up to 2,000 people, which is a ton of people. So don't even worry about the pricing tier. If you're over 2,000, then you can afford $10 a month, I'm sure. Uh, and don't be afraid to send emails. A lot of times people with email lists are scared that they feel like they're spamming, nobody cares about my game. But the fact is, if someone signs up for your video game's email list, then they want to hear about your game. And if they don't want to hear about it anymore, they'll unsubscribe. And it's that easy. You don't hurt anyone's feelings. If they don't like it, they unsubscribe and they're gone and you're fine. But if they signed up for it, they probably want to hear about your stuff. So send them an email. Um, you can send them blog posts about your game. You can send them new trailers, new videos, new previews. Uh, and just try to remember to always use a GIF in your email so that it actually uh, catches their attention, uh, some kind of gameplay GIF or something else. Uh, so yeah, definitely start sending some emails. Uh, quick side note, stop worrying about the numbers. I know I've said a couple times before. But if you only have 50 followers, or 10 email list signups, or seven people on your Twitter account, uh, don't let that get to you. A lot of people get really upset about that. Those 50 people, or those 10 people, are people who are willing to listen to the crap you have to say about your game, who actually care about the thing you're making. So actually cherish them, and make content for them, and, uh, and talk to them, because they don't care about stuff you have to say. Uh, don't constantly look forward to like that, and I'm going to have 10,000 or 100,000 or 2,000 followers. 
Okay, so that's a lot about uh, social media stuff. Let's talk about the Steam store page. So most of the people in here kind of sell their game on Steam. It's where I sell all of my games, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so let's quickly talk about Steam Direct. So Steam Greenlight, where you used to vote for indie games to come onto Steam, is gone. Now you pay $100 to get on Steam, which sounds like it makes it easy, but you actually lose out on a little bit of a marketing chunk there. So what's great about Steam Greenlight is your game would be pushed out to lots of people, and they were told that, hey, this game is potentially coming out, or you're interested in it. And that actually helped grow uh, that first initial burst of fans. So the first uh, 1,000 people who were interested in Chalkin Farmers were just from the Steam Greenlight, and they, they liked it, so they followed it on Steam, they joined the Discord, they signed up for email lists, et cetera. Uh, now that with Steam Direct, that's gone until you pay $100 to get on Steam. Uh, now what that does allow you to do, however, is you can have a coming soon page on Steam for as long as you want. So once you pay your $100, you set up your Steam store page, you put your trailer, your screenshots, your description, and you have now, you now have a coming soon page that can go up on Steam. So now your, your game is technically live on Steam, no one can buy it, but they can add it to your wish, they can add your game to their wish list, which is incredibly important. Uh, why it's important is because when your game comes out, every single person who has it on their wish list gets an email saying, blah, 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 game is now out, you can buy it. Which, as I said before, email is super important because I'm sure you guys get all time when Steam, when Steam sales happen, to your 12 games on your wish list are on sale, right? So your game will show up in that, in that email. Um, every, game, every person who wish lists your game before it comes out is a potential buyer. A small percentage of people are actually buying it on the first day. So you want to get that number as high as possible. And the best way to get that number high is to have a really good coming soon page and have it early. Not a week before your game comes out, not the day before, not a month before, uh, but well before. Uh, and quick disclaimer, you can't actually set your, your game to live for sale until 30 days after you pay the fee. So if you're out on Steam Direct and you're planning on selling a game on Steam, uh, pay the fee now because they have to vet you and check your company and check your tax info and stuff, and then you can actually put your game live. So don't try to do it the week before because it's good. Um, uh, quick tip on coming soon page, uh, have a playable demo on your coming soon page. It really helps people not think it's just some like, fake proof of screenshots or fake video, but actually play your game and fall in love with it and want to play it more. Um, and in addition to that, we'll talk a little bit more about things you can do on your Steam page. So this is a random Steam page I found while browsing Steam the other day. Um, and I wanted to run through some of the, some of the things that it's doing well. Uh, so thing number one at the very, very top, uh, have attention-grabbing caps art. So Steam requires you in every platform, Xbox, Itch, et cetera, requires you to have certain uh, art or box art for your game. So that's something that catches people's attention. It's different from the other games that will be around on Steam. Uh, one little trick I learned once is to actually, if you don't use Photoshop, take a screenshot of Steam and then Photoshop your capsule art onto like the front page and see, does it stand out in front of Civ 6 and super hot and whatever game is selling really well that day. Um, so have good capsule art, have good box art, which kind of goes hand in hand with that. Um, have lots of screenshots on your store page. Uh, have, make sure you tag your game. We're going to talk about that more in a little bit in a second. Uh, and this is a really, really big one that a lot of indies miss. Uh, keep your game updated. So once your coming soon page is out, you can start posting these recent updates. If you play, if you buy games on Steam, you've seen these. This is where developers usually post like, new DLC is out, new content is out, new update is out. But you can post here even when your games are coming soon. And players who are coming to wishlist your game will look at that and if they see the recent updates, it will show if there are no updates, just there's no updates. And they'll, they, a lot of people will consider this game is dead. As we know, the Steam community is a very volatile, angry, judgy community. And so if they see a game with no updates, a lot, of times, a lot of times they assume it's probably abandoned because indie games get abandoned so often. So update your game, as you can see this random game on, indie, on Steam did, uh, where they're actually talking about devlogs and stuff they're working on, stuff that's happening. Uh, it helps people know that the game is still in progress when they, come, when they discover it. Uh, also, absolutely make sure you use GIFs in your store description. Uh, so Steam actually added support for this recently where you can just upload GIFs. It allows people who just skip your trailer and screenshots and just scroll right down. They can see the actual gameplay in your store description and know if this is a the game they're interested in buying. So super secret tip number two, Steam store page tags. So uh, if we go back to the store page, you can see there are tags over there. So every game on Steam is tagged with different genres and other funny things like colorful and funny and cute and, and smiley and violent. Uh, so uh, users basically add these tags when they buy or, or see games on Steam, and then Steam uses that tag, those tags to kind of categorize the game. However, if you as a developer log into Steam under your account, the, the account that made the game, and then you tag your game, your tags will rank higher. So you want to make sure you're tagging your games with relevant tags, but also uh, that you're tagging them at all. So you can see there are all the tags that I put for my game, everything that could very even remotely resemble Shotgun Farms versus a first person shooter. So colorful, cute, cartoony, farmy, family friendly. I even threw Battle Royale in there because you've got to get in on trends uh, and everything else you can think of, multiplayer or whatever. So I make sure to tag everything so that when users are tagging them, the ones I tag them with also rank higher. 
Uh, so tags are one of the things that Steam uses in their algorithm to uh, show people your game. And so it, it lets Steam know that like, oh, if someone who plays a lot of colorful games, they might like your colorful game. And so you want to make sure you have tags with that. Um, super sick tip number three, apparently. Uh, update your capsule art uh, when you reflect new content. So we talked about the box art that your game has. Uh, when your game gets emailed to people that's on, it's on their wish list, uh, if they haven't bought your game and your game has been out, uh, when you make updates for the game, so just free content updates, even paid DLC or whatever, uh, one thing that Steam developers have been doing recently is they'll actually change their box art to say free content update or new map available. So even if we go back to the Shotgun Farmers one on the top right, you'll see my most recent box art says new skins and new game mode. And that way, someone who's had your game on their wish list, they've been getting emails for the past six months, year, saying this game's on sale, this game's on sale, and they still haven't bought it because it's all on their wish list, right? Well, when they see the box art change, it's a slightly better chance they might be like, oh, there's a new thing. Maybe I'll buy it this time. This game is still in development, et cetera. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's going to help me out a lot. And I actually saw a conversion <coughs> sales when I started doing that in my box art. Now, before I resale, I'm rushing to try to make sure I make a new box art that looks cute so people will want to buy it. Um, so pitfall alert, Steam Early Access. Um, so both of my games were in Early Access, and I absolutely love Early Access, so I don't mean to talk about it negatively at all. I just want to make sure people are conscious about early access and know what they're doing when it comes to doing it. Um, so early Steam early access really never has been, but is not a way to just make some money to help you finish your game and see if people like your game or whatever. Um, early access has gone through so, so many different phases where people were abandoning their games and Steam users didn't trust early access games until games like Fortnite and PUBG came out in early access and became like you know worldwide like mind-blowing games. So it's come to a point now where Steam users actually expect good finished games when it's in early access. So when someone's buying an early access game, they're expecting a real video game. There's a reason for the past two years, everyone's, a lot of people have told me, I don't care, I thought Shocker Farmers was done. I thought you were already done with that game. It's because when it came out in early access, I made sure it felt like a complete game. So otherwise, one, people weren't gonna, weren't gonna buy it, and two, if they did buy it, they would have left bad reviews, which will, will make your game suffer when it does come out of early access, and your sales will suffer, which then makes you wonder if your game is worth making or not. So if you're gonna release your game in early access, Make sure it actually feels like a completed game, not an alpha prototype that you're still working on, that you're still messing with. Now, you'll, you'll still make changes to early access, you'll add stuff to the game for sure, but make sure it actually feels like a complete game and not garbage. Uh, the slide over there on the right is from the Slime Rancher post -mortem. If you don't know Slime Rancher, it's a really, really good game uh, that did really, really well on Steam, and he has a GDC talk where he talks about their process and some of the uh, strategies he used in early access. It's a really good GDC talk. I recommend watching it, and every other GDC talk if you can. Um, uh, another disclaimer is the game, the day your game comes out in early access is the day your game came out. So if you're considering early access for your game, don't think that you're going to do early access and then you're going to have this like huge launch that people are going to care about because your game's already out. It's been out for a year. If your game didn't do well in early access, it's going to be, uh, you should be concerned that it might not do well when it comes out either. Because nowadays games that are doing really well are just starting out in early access and doing well that way. So people are expecting good, complete games when it's in early access. Um, so remember that the day of game kind of access is the day that press care, the day that YouTubers care, the day that streamers care, because for them it's just a game that's out. They don't care that much about the access tag. It makes them weary, but it doesn't make them judge your game loss. Uh, okay, next thing. Uh, localize your game. Your, your in-game text, your store page, your marketing. So, um, there are so many more gamers in the world than, uh, so many more gamers outside of the English speaking uh, world, in, in the world, you know what I'm saying. Uh, and they all have money, and they all want to buy your games. And there are way more of them than there are of us. So that's the breakdown of Shocker Farmer sales, I think from the last six months, I want to say. And you can see US is 48%, and the UK is 3%, and then, I guess Australia is also English, but, uh, and Canada. But lots of other countries uh, do not speak, uh, do not speak English as, a, as their first language. And those sales were significantly lower until I translated my game into those languages. So my German <coughs> sales were originally closer to 1% uh, until I translated the game into German. Uh, same with uh, Brazilian Portuguese, same with Canadian, I added a couple of A's into my game. Uh, same with Japanese. Uh, in fact, my Japanese sales were almost at zero until I started uh, uh, translating into Japanese. Um, and uh, if you're worried about how you're going to translate it, uh, and it can be expensive, uh, fans can do this for you for free. So if we're doing a lot of things we talked about earlier, building a Discord community, building an audience around your game, watching development, they will just translate your game for you. Shocker Farmers is in 16 languages. Uh, some of those languages are pretty complicated, like Japanese particularly, and uh, 15 of those 16 languages were done completely for free uh, because the fans who speak that language just want to translate the game. Um, so uh, if you build an audience early, you can get an advantage like that. A single language could cost anywhere from $100 to $1,000, depending on if your game is text-heavy or not. Uh, and so having people do it for you for free because they love your game is, is pretty sweet, in my opinion. 
Uh, Viewberry, what's that's like Fiverr, I've tried a couple of times, but everything I get there is garbage, so it's like five bucks for a translation, but it's usually pretty bad. Uh, and make sure you seek out, this is really important, I learned this um, the hard way, seek out translators not who just know that language, but actually know gaming and understand your game. Uh, 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 the word multiplayer might not translate well to somebody who doesn't understand what multiplayer means in video games versus just trying to translate that word in their own language. So make sure you get translators in every language you're translating to who actually understand gaming and understand your game specifically. Uh, Shotgun Farmers is full of puns like Karakit Launcher and Spectrogus Rifle. So if you don't know what those mean and what those puns are, then you can't translate them properly. Uh, so along with localizing your game, your Steam store page, uh, you also want to start thinking about localizing your marketing. It's something I've been learning really recently. Um, so uh, I think it was just last month, a really big Brazilian YouTuber with 120 million subscribers made a video about Shotgun Farmers. And so I started running Shotgun Farmers and Facebook ads in Brazilian Portuguese targeting Fortnite and TF2 fans. Uh, and this was my highest performing Facebook ad to date. 58,000 impressions and 2,500 uh, 2, uh, clicks on the link. And it cost me about 30 bucks. So that's the ad over there, it's in Portuguese. And the way I got this ad was I went to my Discord in my announcement section and I said, does anyone speak Brazilian Portuguese that need a translation? One, one person said yes, and they translated this ad for me. So uh, it was completely free and made me money. I guess the ad cost me money, but you know. Um, Super secret tip number four. Facebook and Instagram ads are insanely underpriced right now. It's not gonna last forever, uh, but they're ridiculously, ridiculously cheap to get views on your game. Uh, so that's a screenshot of my Facebook ad from like, I think the ads from January maybe. Uh, this is just a random notification I get on my phone every morning about how much I spent the day before. So my budget's still really low because I still try to spend too much money on ads, but you can see just spending six bucks in a day can help you reach a whole bunch of people. And you're probably thinking, well, you spend six bucks, did that get you back six bucks? Uh, my goal, my personal goal with social media ads, uh, this is at least what I think people, how I think people should do, um, is uh, I'm not trying to get people to buy my game with these ads, I'm trying to get them to know my game exists. My number one problem isn't that people don't want to buy my game, it's that they don't know my game exists. Which are people who do find my game do want to buy it because they think it's interesting or they like the hook, but they don't even know what's out there. And so my goal with ads is to get them to know that the game exists, have seen it, to be like, "Oh, I've heard of Shotgun Farms before. Oh, I saw that game with the with the corn gun before." And so I run these ads in different regions, targeting different fans of different games. So I'll target Fortnite fans, or TF2 fans, or Overwatch fans, and I just want them to have scrolled to their Facebook feed, like you've known your Facebook feed and just seen this random product that then you've heard of later on in the day, or later on in the month, or later on in the year. Uh, so my goal of Facebook ads isn't to convert them, which is why I don't spend a thousand or ten thousand dollars, because that's hard to justify if I can't get that money back. But I spend them to just raise awareness of my game, so people know it exists. Because that's the one big problem that I think people need to solve as any devs is a lot of people know that our game even exists. Um, so the rule of seven, it's a really old marketing principle that a prospect needs to see or hear your marketing message at least seven times before they take action. Uh, I'm guilty of this myself. I see ads for stuff all the time, and then it's not until like the sixth, seventh, fifth time that I see something, and I'm just like, yeah, maybe I'll buy that game. Maybe I'll try that thing. Maybe I'll um, buy that product or whatever. And the same thing goes with your game. Get someone to see a YouTube video of your game, and then a Twitch stream of your game, and then a Facebook ad of your game, and then a billboard of your game in Times Square, and then maybe they'll buy it. So we want to make sure we're hitting all those points and getting in front of them as many times as we can. Um, this, is, uh, this is why I do social media ads. This is an ad I made for Shotgun Farmers. Uh, this was like in December, I think. And so there's a, a big YouTuber named Vanos Gaming who made a video of Shotgun Farmers. And in his video, he was holding the chicken. And so it's a, it's a kind of a, a part of the gameplay that became really popular with his community. And so I made this ad on, on Instagram and Facebook of just a quick gameplay of the chicken, of me running around the chicken in the game. And um, as you can see, that, that, uh, this is the sort of views. That did really well. But the interesting thing is, a lot of the responses to this ad was at Vanos Gaming, at Vanos Gaming. So people were tagging that YouTuber, were tagging their friend saying, hey, remember this game that Vanos Gaming played? Hey, look at this, look at this. So this is like not the first time we've heard of Shotgun Farmers. So I was hitting that rule of seven, right? But the most interesting thing is this conversation. This guy over here is he messages, he replies to the ad and he says, oh, didn't Vanos Gaming play this game? And so I said, yeah. He says, wow, it looks cool. I'm going to get it. I don't know if he actually got it, but that was one step closer to him actually getting it. He's watched his famous favorite YouTuber make a video of this game before he didn't buy it. But it was then seeing his Facebook ad that maybe made him consider buying it again. Um, and the interesting thing that he has no idea is that this ad was actually targeting fans of Vanos Gaming, which is why he saw it. So this ad was targeting people who like that YouTuber on Facebook. So when a YouTuber makes a video of my game, I target their fans on YouTube, on Facebook and Instagram to say like to, to remind them that the game exists. So it keeps them from just seeing that one video. Um, so now we're talking about YouTubers and stuff, so let's talk a little about influence. So it's no common secret that influencers nowadays very much impact your sales, way more than the, the standard press does. An article on 
uh, Kotaku will not do as well as getting played by a really big YouTuber. So I want to talk about some of the tools that I use to reach out to YouTubers and streamers. Um, so these are a couple tools. This is Keymailer. Keymailer is a free website. You sign up for this website if your game's on Steam. Uh, basically, what the hell's website works is that YouTubers request Steam keys from you. So if you look there at the bottom on the screenshot, those are all, so all the big, I mean, you know, those are all the people I haven't given it to. So I can request people with like 10,000, 100,000. Um, the biggest I ever got thing on, on Keymailer was maybe 300,000 subscribers, and so I has to check the green box and that gives them a key immediately. They just get a free copy of the game, right? Which is what you want. You want YouTubers to play your game. So these are people who have a good key too, which is you can see their sub counts, 400, 200, et cetera. So that, what's cute about it is that they kind of watch their sub count grow, and then when they earn it, I'll send them a Steam key when they get to 1,000 subscribers, which is my minimum. Um, so Keymailer is cool because it's free. You just make an account, you put your Steam keys on there, and then they ask you for keys. You know they're, you know they're, they're vetted because Keymailer will show you their history, do it on their channel, see what kind of videos they make. Um, they also have a paid option where you can pay to get featured so that those YouTubers see your, your game more or to uh, target them directly and send them, like find YouTubers for your game. Uh, another website, very similar vein, is Woovit, uh, exactly like Keymailer, except uh, instead of them requesting Steam keys from you, you set minimum requirements. So you say, anyone who has 1,000 subscribers on YouTube and 10,000 followers on Twitch can have a free copy of my game. You upload your Steam keys, and those YouTubers, they see your game, they click um, accept offer, and they get a free copy of your game. And you're going to pay for those spots up top where you see it's green and blue. You can pay the feature on there as well. By the way, the basic feature of it is completely free. I've yet to put a dime into Move It in Key Miller. I've gotten uh, millions of views on YouTube thanks to these services. So it's pretty awesome. Um, so and then their paid features aren't that expensive, which is what I found I'm doing on launch day. It's only 60 bucks, so 200 bucks, depending on how you want to be featured to be featured on Move It. So that's nothing because you want to be able to make that feature game easily. Uh, Indie Boost is a newer alternative. Um, to move it in Keymailer. It kind of combines the two things. It's also free, but it's mostly paid. Uh, and basically how it works is you set up a game account there, influencers can find your game and request the key, but you can also have IndieBoost uh, mass send out keys for your game. So they have a, a, a list of a few thousand YouTubers and streamers and press people, and so you can basically give them 5,000 Steam keys and they mass send it out to everybody. Um, they can also send out press releases for you as well. Um, but keep in mind, using one of these services, buying one of those tiers, does not replace you actually contacting people. If you're marketing your game, um, I didn't say this, I guess, in the talk, but it's, I think it should be obvious that you should be emailing press people and YouTubers and streamers uh, about your game and sending copies of your game. So using these services doesn't replace that. You still want to be actually reaching out personally to uh, big streamers and YouTubers about your game. Uh, this is just another way to get them because they may not have seen your email and they might see this one and they like or trust one of these services. Uh, super secret tip number five, Wubit has this thing called Wubit Search. It's super awesome. Basically on their website, it's completely free. You go to their search thing. You can just type in the name of a game and it will show you YouTubers through their service who have played that game. So if your game is a top-down shooter like that random game I found earlier on Steam, you can type in Enter the Dungeon, find other YouTubers who like Enter the Dungeon and have played many multiple videos of it. Now you can go to their YouTube page, get their email address, send them an email saying, hey, I think you might like my game. So Wubit Search is pretty good. Um, Pitfall Alert. I know I've talked about a lot of tools to do marketing, a lot of ways to reach influencers. One of these things isn't enough. Just doing one of the things I talked about is not going to be enough to make your game do well. Doing all of these things is not going to be enough to do, make your game do well. But they're all tools that you need in your marketing belt, and you should be doing as many of them as you can. Uh, really should be doing all of them, because they're really not Just keep that in mind. Don't do uh, what I see a lot of people do, and it makes me really sad. I see them do just like one of these things, or one of these services, or just make an Instagram account, and they're like, I did it. I did something today. My game is getting marketed, but it's not. So you gotta do that. Um, so talking more about influencers, uh, we need to build a relationship with influencers. I know big YouTubers, Markiplier, and PewDiePie, and, and other people with names, they seem really scary because they're these celebrities and everyone wants their attention and they're awesome and they're cool, um, and, but they're also people. They're just regular, really, really young kids a lot of the time who would like to play video games and make a lot of money doing it. Uh, so don't feel like you can't talk to them. Even though they probably won't hear you, it doesn't hurt to try. Uh, what I try to do, and I highly encourage everyone in this room to do it, respond to every tweet about your game. Respond to every YouTube video that's made about your game. Like the video, number one, because YouTubers love getting their videos liked. And I write a comment on their videos. I try to, so I have a, a search on my, uh, my bookmarks bar that's for Shopping Farmers on YouTube, sorted by upload dates of the most recent videos. Uh, and every day I look at that video, and there's, a, you know, there's one or two people who play Shopping Farmers that day, I thumbs up their video, and I say thank you for playing the game. And they say, oh my god, the creator commented on my video, this is amazing, my, my day has been made, right? So it's, it's a big deal if you can connect with, with a potential audience that way. So they're, they're fans of your game, they're making videos of your game. Similar with YouTubers, they, some of them do actually read their comments, the most part they probably will miss your comments, 
But it doesn't mean you shouldn't come anyway. So this is a video of a really big YouTuber, uh, Moo Gaming, who's played Chocolate Farms for the past two years, and he, he hates it. He hates the game. He plays it like he hates it as in like Rage hates it. And he plays it with his friends who love Shotgun Farmers, and so in every video he rages and talks about how much he hates it. So uh, last month or two months ago he made a video saying why I stopped playing Shotgun Farmers, and he made a video of Shotgun Farmers which of course got me views and sales. And so I commented on the video saying, oh, I'm sad to see you're leaving Shotgun Farmers, blah, blah, blah. He probably never saw the comment, but his community did, his millions of followers did, and they all responded to my comment, a bunch of them responded to my comment saying, oh, he was just joking, oh, don't take it seriously, oh my god, you're the developer, right? And that built that connection with people who uh, now realize, oh, the developer is here in the room. Even if, even if the creator doesn't see your content, uh, their community will see it. So that's still more potential fans of your game. Because a lot of people watch YouTube videos and they just leave. But that gives another chance for them to engage with you and then re engage with the game. They might click on your channel, see the trailer of your game. 99% so. um, of them won't see, all, won't see your comment, all this noise, but 1% of them might. And then you might actually have that person tweet about your game when it's on sale. So uh, that YouTube, that um, Twitter screenshot right there is a YouTuber called BitGamer. He's one of the bigger YouTubers in, uh, in Brazil. He was the one who made that video before that I made an ad for. Uh, he likes our farmers a lot, so he made a video about it, and so I commented on his video uh, and started talking to him. And so he actually heard, he actually responded to my comments. And now, when the game went on sale three days ago for the Steam Lunar New Year sale, he retweeted my tweet about the game sale to his like X hundreds of thousands of followers. So uh, most of the YouTubers I've commented on videos didn't respond, but the ones that have ended up returning, uh, returning in the in the work. Uh, super secret mega tip number six: slide into their DMs. Again, talking about Van Loss Gaming, uh, so I can show you my Twitter messages. This, this is not the only one I want to use him because he's the biggest YouTuber that I'm in contact with. Um, he's got something like 27 million subscribers on YouTube. He's like top six, I think, in gaming YouTubers in the world. You'd think he would never talk to me. I assumed so too. Uh, so one day I decided to just DM him on Twitter because why not? His DMs were open, so I figured I would try it. And so I said, hey, like, thanks for your videos of my game. I really appreciate it. But it was just after I've already commented on his videos, he hasn't answered them. I uh, replied to his tweets and he didn't answer them. So then I tried to DM him to see what would happen. And I said, would you want to be in Chocolate Farmers? He didn't answer, so I figured he hates my guts. And then a month later, he said yes. And so now, one of the biggest YouTubers in the world is in my game. And because he's in my game, he then made a video about the game with his friends who are also in the game because I, I asked them and then they told their friends and then their friends asked me. Uh, and that video went on to have 1.8 million views. This is just their most recent video of the game, which then went on to help the game sell really well that week as well. Um, so, why are influencers important? Uh, this is a stat of the total views of Shotgun Farmers uh, in the past few years. It's been out 38 million views and counting, thanks to Dale's TubeStat 3000. Definitely a super cool tool. He has the counting of views you have on YouTube. Um, why are they important? That photo on the right is a picture of me showing the game at the Rochester Game Festival, I think it was called. Um, this was uh, early that last year, last fall. So I saw the game in Rochester mainly because uh, they asked me and Kobe to go out there and show our games because we were in their competition. So the booth, the very first kid who came up to my game, walked up, he was like, whoa, shotgun farmers. And I was just like, you know this game, Ryan, from Rochester? And I looked at him, he was wearing a red shirt with an owl logo on his chest. And he was just like, yeah, my favorite YouTuber plays this game, but I never got to buy the game. And so he's, he's playing the game, his mom's there, she's watching him. She realizes that it's not a super violent game, it's not like other games that she doesn't want him to play. And she starts talking to me, and she's like, oh, so it's a cartoon game for kids? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, he's really wanted it, so I'll, I'll probably get it for her today. Don't know if she actually bought it, but it's just an example of why influencers are important, because it's random to get Rochester, do what my game was, even though I never met. I never marketed it to him. Uh, Pitfall alert, I've been talking a lot about big YouTubers. Don't just target the top five PewDiePie's in the world. A content creator with only a thousand followers might go on to tweet about your game and stream your game every week or make videos about your game uh, to their audience. And they have an audience too, and that audience is those real people, real gamers, who are interested in games like yours. Um, these, these smaller YouTubers can turn to hardcore fans and in turn make more hardcore fans. An example on the right is one of Wisdom, uh, whose YouTubers have been making Shotgun videos for, I don't know, like a year now. He has 200 and something, uh, was it was 216 or 214, videos of Shark he posts like multiple videos a week uh, to his almost 10,000 subscriber following, right? So you, you've got to make sure you're paying attention to the small YouTubers as well. Don't just hope Mark Fire pays your game and you're going to become a millionaire, because that's not how it works. You need everyone playing your game, so they are listening to play your game. Um, so share, the game, share your game with smaller streamers because they don't care about your game as well. Okay, so talking about your social media presence, Stop being a TV ad, please. I'm so tired, I, I was guilty of this. I don't mean to be dogging on you guys, but I'm guilty of this too, or was. So many indies, you look at their Twitter feed or their Instagram feed or their Facebook feed, it's, my game's on sale, you should buy my game. Hey, my game's out, oh, my game's out, you should buy my game. And I'm tired and tired of seeing it because guess what happens to these feeds? 
Nobody cares. Nobody cares if your game's not unless they already care about your game. What people want on social media is they want real content, right? The people you follow on social media isn't someone who's just trying to sell you the, the best new thing every week. It's people who are just saying funny things or cool things or cute things or cool pictures you're interested in. So make sure your social media feed and your game social media feed is the same. Give them cool content, show screenshots to your game, talk about behind the scenes content. Don't just make, make sure your entire feed isn't on sale now. Now, nothing against the game, Deliver Us the Moon, this game looks awesome, I'm sure it's gonna do really well, but their social media is off because it's just full of just trying to sell people your game. That's not gonna work if people aren't already invested in your game. Very rarely does someone just see an on sale now and be like, yeah, I should buy it. Uh, so yeah, please don't become a TV ad. Think about social media as getting away, getting away people connect with you, not just the way to get a commercial. Uh, so getting into making social media content, super secret tip number seven. Uh, pillar content, this credit goes to uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's content model, it's called Pillar Content Strategy. And the idea is basically, you don't have to, um, uh, I guess I, I skipped something, but basically what I want you guys to focus on is making more stuff on social media. So going back to being a TV ad thing, uh, the other thing I see with a lot of indie social media stuff is that you look at someone's Twitter feed or their Instagram feed or their Facebook page for their game and it's just like, one month ago, you should get my game on Steam. Three months ago, my game's coming on Kickstarter soon. Six months ago, hey look, I'm making a game. Right? That, if, you want people, if you want people to engage with your game, you need them, uh, you need to be putting out content all the time about your game and what, what you're working on and stuff. Um, so make stuff every single day uh, about your game. Put out something every single day. I know that sounds really hard, but it doesn't have to be. If it's a screenshot or a picture of your desk or a picture of your cat while you're talking about your game, just put out one thing every day. And if you just do one of those, you can then distribute one of those to all the social media, right? So if you make one big filler comment, say it's a really short blog post, that blog post can go on your Steam page as, a, as an update, it can go on your, your game's Facebook page, it can go on your Twitter page as just an excerpt of that blog post, it can go on your Instagram page as a photo with that blog post attached, it can go on your game's Tumblr, your WordPress, you can distribute across all things. You don't have to worry about making one for every single social media, but just make one thing that you can share across all of them. And then you can break up those things and become multiple things. So one big blog post can become six tweets if you break it up all that. Um, that's kind of what this talks about. You can make one YouTube video that becomes multiple Instagram clips. So if you're worried about how to make lots of content every day, one YouTube video a week, so say you make that video where you talk about the updates you made to your game that week, you can break that up and make that multiple Instagram post throughout the, throughout the week. So now you have seven Instagram posts throughout your week. And every single time you put a post on Instagram, or a tweet on Twitter, or a post on Facebook, that's a chance for one more person to find your game versus the potential zero that knows about your game right now. Um, and each day you don't post about your game is another day that someone um, miss five miss out on your game, another game, another day you complain that nobody knows your game exists. Uh, and if you think you have nothing to talk about in your game, if you made a commit today on your game, if you push something to your repository, then there's something you can talk about. So, so Snapchat a picture of it, Instagram picture of it, Twitter picture of it. Um, I don't know how we're done. Good? Okay. Super mega bonus tips if there's time, because I don't share it every time. Um, Okay, uh, I have a press kit, another really obvious one, but I just want to make sure I say some of the obvious stuff. Hope I didn't miss some obvious stuff, but uh, have a press kit. Do press kit is the standard, um, but you can make custom weight ones as well. It's getting more and more popular as more people have do press kits. Uh, it's just a, it's a website, it's a thing you download, it's PHP, and you set up your game. It's information and screenshots and trailers. It's something that press and YouTubers are really used to getting. Easy way for them to know what your game is, what history is, where your trailer is, how much it costs, etc. So make sure you make one of those. Look it up at dopresskit.com. Uh, more thing about Discord, if you are going to Discord watch a game, which you should today, or I'll be upset. Um, create roles in your Discord. Don't just make a Discord and be like, cool, it's good to go. Uh, people who are in Discord really like roles. I don't, I don't know why, but it's very, it's gaming, it's a formy thing, right? So Discord, you can set up roles. You can see those are the roles there on the far right. And Chocolate Farmer is like painter, and YouTuber, and idea maker. And basically, these are roles that you and your moderators can assign to people. So people who make fan art in Chocolate Farmer's Discord, for example, can assign the role painter. And so then, uh, in Discord, you can actually show those roles as separate. So this is my, this is the Chocolate Farmer's Discord, probably. So you can see the roles here. So this is the tournament staff. There's the wiki editors. There's the world champions. So they'll actually be separated on the right from the long list of regular users down here. And what happens with that is you start getting the primate hierarchy thing, yeah. uh, where people, you get the private heart and people are like, wow, how'd you become an alpha tester? How'd you become a painter? I want to get that role because it changes your color. When, when you, yeah, when you get a role one of those roles, your name in Discord becomes that color. So all of a sudden you stand out from everybody else on Discord. So people, people pine after that. They actually do. Trust me. Uh, and so they will, uh, they will engage with your Discord a lot more if they have roles they can actually achieve. This gives them a reason to be in your Discord. 
So make roles, make controls separately, create lots of Discord channels, and make Discord channels actually encourage stuff. So if, uh, in Chart Farmers Discord, there's channels for, so channels are basically the different sections of your forum. Um, there's channels for bugs, which encourage people to report bugs to me there instead of DMing me or emailing me. Uh, there's channels for suggestions, which encourages them to stop spamming my DMs with suggestions, just post them all there, and I can just like, ignore them and read them in bulk. Um, there's channels for uh, custom suggestions and weapon ideas, and it's all these things that players want to communicate to you, give them a place to just vent about it, talk to other players about it, and then the good ideas can come out of that and you can even use them in the game if you want to. But it encourages them to then, then work on those or that kind of content. Uh, and then also talk in your Discord. Don't be someone who just lurks and watches because they're there because they want to engage with the developer. The, the, the time of the, the, the that we're in right now is people are really used to interacting with developers now. Even Blizzard puts out weekly Overwatch developer diaries with the actual developer there in front of the camera. People, gamers are, are getting more and more used to actually being able to interact with developers in some way or another. And when you're a small indie, it makes even more of a difference if they can interact with you directly. So tell them their idea is good, tell them you're listening to them, tell them, don't tell them their idea is bad, but just tell them it's not what you're directly looking for. Um, other bonus tip, use emojis in your tweets so you stand out. Now Twitter has like crazy thousand, four thousand character count or whatever. Um, you can use emojis and line breaks to make your tweets look different from all the other tweets everyone's seen. So for example, whenever I go live on Twitch, I try to post this red record button that says live, and this is not something I came up with, it's an example I took from someone else who talked about this as well. Uh, and these emojis, as much as you probably hate them and you're cringing because you're super cool and you don't want to do that, uh, they help break your content up for everyone else's content. So don't have to do it my way if that makes you feel gross. If we do it your own way, do something different. Don't look like every other tweet. If your tweet's just text, 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 hashtag, 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 no image, you know, everyone's just going to scroll past it because it's more interesting content on Twitter. So try to make more interesting tweets. Uh, stop being an old person. I don't care how old or young you are. Get on young people's social media. If you hate Snapchat, you hate Instagram because you're super cool and you're super old, it doesn't matter. The people who are buying your game are young. Old people are dying, and they're not going to be buying your games 10 years from now. Young people are going to be buying your games from now. Those Fortnite fans that you hate so much because they're young and lame and terrible, they're the ones buying your games 10 years from now when you try to make more indie games. So get on their social medias, communicate with them, get them to become fans of your stuff. Um, uh, some last really, really random things. Uh, since Greenlight is gone, Kickstarter has strangely emerged as this thing. It's a great place to find proof of concept. So uh, some people think our Kickstarter now is a way to get money for the product, and it still is that, but it's strangely enough to start becoming a place where people are just, people who don't need the money are making Kickstarters, they've been doing this a lot. Uh, well, they'll just put up a Kickstarter for, like, Penny Arcade does for a dollar, but some companies will do, like, a thousand, or ten thousand, or twenty thousand, they know they need a hundred thousand, but they really do it to see would people actually pay money for this game. Because what happens a lot is you put out any game and no one pays for it, because they were never going to pay for it. So you can make a Kickstarter, um, a lot of times you can see would people have actually paid for this game in the first place. Kickstarter fails, Maybe it's time to pivot, reconsider your hook, change it, something else. Or go on to the thing. Um, and very, very, very last thing I thought of this just when I was walking out of the house today. Watch Ryan Clark's Clark Tank on Twitch and YouTube. Ryan Clark is the developer of Crypto Necrodancer. Uh, he has a Twitch channel where he streams every, every once Friday every month. We have both highlights on YouTube where he just talks about indie game marketing even further. He breaks down Steam sales for that week and all the games are doing well and things that people are doing well in indie game business stuff. And it's really amazing and blows my mind every week. So watch it. In conclusion, if you say you don't like marketing, then maybe you shouldn't be an indie game developer because that's part of the job. Uh, if you don't market your, your game, you'll probably fail. Stop waiting until your game is done. Stop waiting until your game is perfect. Start doing it right freaking now. Literally, when I finish this talk, please take out your phone, start your Discord, start your Instagram channel, start your Facebook posts. Hope to see all the cool stuff you guys start posting after today. Thank you. Follow me on Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, positive. Uh, there'll be food and we'll play lots of shotgun farmers. If you're coming to the party, you'll be expected to play shotgun farmers, but also we'll be celebrating because the game comes out of early access in 23 days, which is why I'm not sure why I'm up here talking to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Where's the party? Here. Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> here, free entry, no cover, and no music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Jared, I'm sorry. Uh, how did you, it might seem like a dumb question, but how did you... No, no question. Um, the, how did you know when people say stuff about your game? Is it just because you're active in the community? That's really good. You mean like on Twitter and Facebook and stuff? Uh, yeah, so by stalking the internet. So uh, TweetDeck is a really good one for Twitter. So TweetDeck is a website you can use and basically, um, 
but it's basically you can just like set up, you can set up searches and it'll just show you all the recent tweets in that search. So uh, every six hours or so, I just click the tweet deck tab on my bookmarks bar and it shows me all the recent tweets with the word shopping farmers in it. A lot of times it's videos about farmers that accidentally shop themselves in like the rural areas, but a lot of times it, I get a lot of really interesting farmer like tweets of like, if I was a farmer, I'm just going there with a shotgun and just blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you'll also be able to be my, you also give you a separate tab, so it's basically multiple columns. So I have one column with shopping farmers, it's very general, because people will misspell the game or a shopping farmer. One tab with shopping farmers in quotation, which is exactly that phrase, and that's how I see whenever someone tweets about the game. So the moment, or the moment within a few hours of someone saying, hey, this game shopping farmers looks cool, I like it. And they're like, oh snap, it's the developer. Or when people in other languages will run like, more recent people started tweeting about a lot in Japanese for some reason, so all this, I just had Google Translate for Arigato, but I'm also, I just uh, tweet that back to them. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they'll respond in English, so they know how to speak Japanese. Um, uh, so yeah, that's how I do with Tweet Deck. With YouTube, I did a thing where I just search, I sort YouTube by most recent, and I look at that every two hours. Um, uh, those are pretty much the only two that I actually look at, I guess. Uh, I didn't have Google set up, which I never actually get anything for because, so for me, it's a quick weird disclaimer that my games haven't got very much regular traditional press coverage, which is why I talk so much about influencers and not regular press. The more Marines I talk to, the more Marines talk about for how much regular press isn't doing stuff for them. I don't think you should ignore them. You should still contact Kotaku and Polygon and stuff, and maybe they'll write a bunch of stuff. Uh, but when I jammed an article about Shotgun Farmers last year, nothing happened. But when the, in the, a month later, when Big YouTuber made a video about the game, people bought the game. So, um, yeah. Where, do you have a a certain uh, channel you find you got more, more traffic than anything. Is YouTube getting YouTube. more than like, and is it because of like the long form clips of games where something like if you're just doing stills, it's not really getting much because you're showing them the gameplay? Yeah, I think the thing is a speed versus search engine. So, like, well, you should be doing Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff. Um, they're feeds, so they're gone. No one searches Twitter for stuff, uh, or like for something specific or the product, especially. Whereas YouTube, someone's going there and searches your game, that video is there forever. So like these videos that YouTubers make of the game, people find it years from now, months from now, weeks from now, and then that still help convince that person about the game. Whereas a Twitter or Instagram post about the game is only relevant for that day or two or once in someone's feed, and then it's just gone. So those are like those like feed-based social media posts are really good for like getting out hashtags, then they're gone. So you can't feel like you did an Instagram post today and then you're good for marketing for the week because it's gone. So yeah, YouTube videos help you start more, more evergreen because they last a little longer. So yeah, YouTube has been the biggest one, I think, for me that has that. Yeah. Um, you got two things. One, can, can I get all the slides? Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to take a lot of notes, but I didn't get everything. Yeah, if you could get the slides up somewhere. Recording this, so that will probably go up somewhere. Ooh. Yeah, there'll be a recording for members or something. The other thing is, like, what's your, what's your take on, like, going to cons and showing stuff up. That yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, so I've been to a lot of cons. My very first game, I went to a lot of conventions. I spent a bunch of money, and the game didn't sell very well. Uh, but that's not because of cons directly, obviously. It's because of the way I marketed the game. Uh, I'm not so big on cons because they cost a crap ton of money. Just going, even if the convention is cheap or local, or even if it's a convention like two cities away, it was going to cost me $200 a night, or $200 in food and and, and he's saying like the cheapest every I can find or whatever. Um, I personally think that's what I could be spending on trying to contact a YouTuber who will give me millions of views versus that con that might give me a thousand people to play, or not even a thousand. Like, uh, people at PAX get 700 people to play the game about, and they spend thousands of dollars to play the game. They don't want the really small booth. And if you have a bigger booth, you have a better present, and a bigger booth, you might get a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. And for me, being self funded and with all of my going includes myself, I don't have the funds to fund that, and so I don't think it's worthwhile where I could spend that money on just developing the game and trying to get it from a uh, a bigger content creator or influencer. That's my perspective. People are very different, like, find them very different. Ways. So I played Skyhook at Indie Kids. Really? That's awesome. <laughs> um, so my question is... Did you buy it? Uh, yes. Oh, damn it. I was hoping you didn't. I'm going to prove the point. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for buying it. Um, so the question is, um, first off, now that this game became popular, yeah. has that interest, is there attracted to you as a person has that attracted sales in your previous game? Um, and two, since there is such a big difference between uh, you know, Skyhook yeah. and Shotgun Farmers, um, what was the thing that showed you that you were doing marketing all wrong? Well, that's a really good question. Okay, well, the first question was, what? <laughs> Shotgun um, Farmers drive sales. Oh, it was Skyhook. very small, um, I mean, not in, not in a huge amount mainly because like you were saying with the difference in genres and stuff too is like people who are big fans of farmers are more big fans of shooters. It's also a harder time in the industry for 2D platformers and stuff. Uh, and uh, Shark Sky was a local only game versus online games. People play this game on online games. 
Um, very small people who are like really, really hardcore fans of, of the Quasi TV brand. They do pretty much all own Skyhook or will go and buy it. A lot of people will literally just tell me, I just bought the game just to support you, do you know, play Skyhook. Um, and so in a very small percentage, not enough that it's mattered in terms of like uh, my livelihood, uh, but definitely in a certain small amount, yeah, but not enough to make a difference. Skyhook is still uh, like very, very important selling in, in, in comparison. Um, uh, and second question was, uh, what was the thing that? Yeah, what made me realize it? Uh, I obsess, I, so I didn't have to talk about GT talks and collecting stuff before, so I obsess over trying to learn about this stuff, because I know I'm doing it wrong all the time. Like, oh, and I, I always know I'm doing something wrong, it's more than so I watch every GDC talk I can, it's all kinds of anything that I can do in my games, if it's shooters or marketing or whatever. Uh, so really it was just listening to a lot of other indies talk about stuff that uh, they learned, and then realizing that was all true for me. So really listening to other talks, and, and the GDC talk to talk about mistakes people made, uh, and wondering like, why didn't my game sell? At first, at first I was just like, Oh, like being an indie so hard right now, and it sucks, and no one wants to buy my games anymore. And I realized it's because of things that I did in the way I positioned my game. Um, and so, a big part of that was the hook. Like, Skyhook, ironically, while I had made the word hook in it, didn't have a very strong hook. It was a 2D platform where we followed grappling hooks, which actually confuses people every time I say it. Whereas, look for shotgun farmers, uh, multiplayer shooter where your, uh, your mission shots grow guns, makes people go, wait, what? So, they actually chose entry. So, maybe if I went back, I could have found some way to change the hook in Skyhook or make it seem more. Uh, Make sure both heads more, more. So that, that's that was that question. Sorry. Yeah. You got a point to me, and that's how I know I'm activated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talked about you know not like going by a studio, like being a person, I guess. Yeah. And then also you know not just advertising in your feed. So I feel like those things are like pretty well connected, where you can use your social media to create a personality, right? Like. In your professional capacity, so like, how I know that you've done things that are not so related to shotgun farmers that are more about quasi and like quasi day. Like, what kind of stuff do you think about when you like? How do you how do you frame that media that you put out that builds your persona over yeah. over just like your game? Yeah, it's a really good question. I guess the way I try to approach it is I try to keep my content from being opinionated. I just try to keep it about what I'm doing. And so my, because I do stuff full time, my life is consumed by it. So a lot of what I'm doing throughout the day is related to the game. Um, but if I'm like, if I decide that day that I hate the Patriots, which I, I, mean, that, I guess that's fine to do. If you hate the Patriots, you can tweet about it or whatever. But I just keep that stuff out of it. And I, so it's consistently, if you're looking at my feeds, it's just about my, my work and my production. And so uh, it, it, that's kind of what you mean, like how to keep your personal stuff out of it, or not? Um, no, kind of the opposite, I guess. Like. How do you make it about yourself? Like Phil Fish, like I think of him as a personality, like first mm -hmm. and foremost, like you mentioned him before. Yeah. Um, and certainly like he's made games and stuff, but like I feel like there's there's an ability for developers to have a presence as a or like Rami, right? Like Yeah, that's what I'm saying you should do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying I'm saying be a personality. Oh yeah. If I know. you can, yeah. yeah. Or if you're small. I mean if you're a group of five then be a group personality. So you can be your studio, but it's five of you right. as a personality. But like, why do I know like Rami and like not? If, yeah, exactly. That's my point. Well, yeah. I don't know why I know them, but the question is, what's Rami's company? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. But you know that. But, but it's like the majority of Indies who do know Rami don't know if Rami games. They don't like Rami games, or like, right? Which is that. So I think you're agreeing with. Yeah, I'm definitely agreeing. With you. But I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. I got okay. why. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're also very like. I don't know, like they have, they're, they're very hooky personas in themselves, like Phil Fish is Phil Fish. Yeah. Uh, and really, the movie was not a big part of that, but like, Rami as a hook. What? Uh, uh, Rami as a hook um, uh, is like he travels the world and he talks about everything he can go to, he goes to every single convention. It's just very, they're very loud about their their views on, on game development. I think maybe that's a big part of it. They just speak up. Basically. They speak up, yeah, about how they end the games. And a lot of people are really used to just making your game and everything else like that. And they talk about all of it. I have a big mind, some biggest minds people we can think of. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you had to deal with like use any techniques to evade like the negative aspects of being like somewhat public about the game or deal with like? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I had once uh, someone messaged me, private messaged me on Twitch while I'm live, saying, "Hey, just a quick question: Is this your home address?" And it was my parents' address, and I was just like, "Oh, I crushed myself." Anyway, um, they, they messaged me and they were like, is this your home address? And I was just like, 
No, but it was. Not my address, my, my old address is because it's so easy to find this address where you just look up their DNS records like a website when you register a website or whatever. I had hard registration at the time, so I didn't consider that stuff. So uh, that is stuff to consider. I mean, no one's ever tried to like, talk to me or tell me or something. Like, there are very few for all the personalities that exist, like come to people's houses and stuff, but like no one's really been in too much danger. Um, but I mean, just doing the regular process you should do anyway, like have privacy on all your websites because people just see your home address right now, like if they want to just come kill you because you, I don't know, something, so like waffles. Um, so yeah, just have basic privacy to help. I, when I like film stuff, like when I do vlogs, I try not to shoot this, my, my intersection on my street, uh, but I've been seeing more and more YouTubers who are not afraid to do it, so sometimes I wonder if it's been worth the extra effort. I try to show my license plate and blow stuff like that. It's true because I try to be smart how I play it, but. No, what about like, also like, have you ever had like really bad Steam review that you felt like, you had to like deal with mentally. Uh, like, no, uh, no. I mean, in my first game, yes. I think mean, that's the thing I learned is just you, know, you can't take any of that stuff personally for sure. And that's really easier said than done. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I read the Steam reviews and I just try to understand their point of view and I get it. And in fact, I I really appreciate it. When someone says they hate my game or that it's garbage, I appreciate it because I can see why they hate it. And I know they're not the only ones who feel that way, right? Someone someone recently posted. On um, Shopping Farmers discussion forums on Steam, said this game shouldn't be allowed to be sold because it doesn't have as many players as the other multiplayer games I'm playing. And I, and I totally get his perspective. So like, I didn't let that hurt me, but I understood that like if he feels that way, other players are just like, well, this game is not as big as um, Fortnite or something, so why should I play it? I've got to figure out ways to, to, to follow that more problem. So yeah, just try to like see that point of view, I guess. It helps me not be sad, because I do get that. Do you have, what are your opinion, what's your opinion on like, giving and giving it away for a limited time or saying just here it is, just have it. And yeah. I don't care, just play it, do whatever, and then at some point releasing it and say this is you know the next version and it's gonna be five bucks, whatever your pricing is. Because at some point I always say the struggle is just like an artist and content producer that yeah. putting yourself behind a paywall yeah. is not, if you're not established, if you don't have a record, if people yeah. don't really know you you have stuff already, you are, are still trying to build an audience, like give your stuff away. Like all the music I have is available for free. Mm -hmm. But I still don't get the, the downloads that I'm looking for. Right. And promote, yeah, you know, exactly. promoting it is obviously something that needs to be more of. But how do you determine, like, yeah, this is worth X amount of dollars, or just give it away? You guys ask all the hard questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, just about that. So for me, it, uh, well, I've thought about that a lot. Luckily for me, it's simple because I, I can't eat if I don't make, make cost money. Uh, I have considered giving away shopping farms for free to solve. So like, as a multiplayer game, I have a very hard player-based problem where there's not enough people playing the game all the time. And so I've actually reached out to Bob and said, hey, I want to do a free weekend. So I thought we were doing free weekends. I said, that's the way to do it. Do my game for free for, for two days. And then everybody will download it. They'll tell all their friends. And when it goes on sale, everyone will buy it. And uh, my father actually said he highly recommends against it because what they've been seeing recently is a lot of indies try to do that. What happens is a lot of people get your game for free and then they never come back because they go back to their regular games. Because just because your game was is free doesn't solve the problem that they don't want to play your game right now. Uh, it's not, a lot of times they're not buying because of the money, they're buying because of something else interested in it. Uh, so similarly, like you're saying, like people work, like, promotion is a big part of it too. But just having something for free doesn't always mean people are going to find out about it. So you just have to like, if you're going to put all the work to get them to find out about it, then the cost of that work, a lot of times they'll just buy it anyway, people are willing to buy stuff. I think it's, uh, they're not, they're, people aren't jumping into free stuff as much as they could without that free thing having millions of dollars behind it, or hundred thousand dollars behind it in marketing. Um, so yeah, I don't think it over by just knowing I need to pay for my stuff. In terms of figuring out what price it is, I struggle with that with every single project. Uh, what Andy told me recently is that to stop underpricing, because we're all racing to the bottom and stuff, uh, and so uh, to stop underpricing your games, uh, because when people, uh, it's interesting because we think that maybe if I just make my game like a dollar, everybody will buy it. But the average game consumer, when they see a dollar game, they're like, oh, this is probably some trashy game that's not going to be good. So maybe they'll buy it for no kids, maybe they'll just go on to the next game. So when they see a $5 game, they're like, oh, maybe this is some decent, quickly made indie game. A $10 game, like Jack of Harmers is, I, hopefully when they start to think it has some value. And then with a $25 game, it better damn be good. And so I try to like correlate what I think my actual game's value is realistically, looking at it. Um, compared to like other games in the genre. So like, are there are other shooter games out there that are $25, but they have like next-gen graphics, and I can't make my game $25. Because uh, it just doesn't look, even if it's not next-gen, it has to look better. It's like a little poly and stylized. So I try to tier it similar to that. I am so guilty of underpricing my stuff. A lot of people have told me I should price my game at 15, but I've been bid at 10 for two years, and it's going to kind of be for that price, and uh, overpriced my next game. I think 15 is a sweet spot. Maybe a good, rich indie game that 15 is the, game, is the price you're aiming for. Uh, and yeah, Shocker recently said, 
we really tries to do with his design is he aims towards certain price point. So when he comes up with the content and features he wants in his game, he tries to think of what will make it worth $15 or $10 or $5 versus make your game and then try to price it. So he tries to design around the price because he also uh, like, wants to make it worth Yeah. When do you think is the right time if you choose to do a physical release? Oh, I have no idea. I would probably never do a physical release as long as someone paid for it. Do you mean for digital hookups? Or well, actually, like, say, say if it's a limited run, like. <coughs> Oh, I mean, digital <laughs> games suck. <laughs> Tabletop uh, games are the only actual games. Digital games are not real. Tabletop games are actually real. But I mean, like, like um, let's say Undertale. Undertale was... Yeah, so a lot of that stuff was funded by other people. Like, under, like Undertale was physical once it had made a $32 million or it like, started out just a physical run. So like, most of the copies of games that are physical you see are actually they've already made a million. And so at that point, it's just it's fine to do it because the investment of that, it's, it's crazy investment to put a game in a box on store. And so most of the times those are either funded by third parties or the game is made so much more money that it's just worth the extra money. But things like IndieBox, stuff like that often they're funding it, so it's not, I don't think it's worth a lot for me to do, no, I don't think anyone, most people buy their games usually now anyway, especially younger, younger gamers are buying everything usually on their stuff, so. I don't think they're gonna find your game if it's in, in game stuff. They're just gonna like, what's this brand thing, they'll just keep going. How has uh, interacting with your fan base affected your ethical decisions and artistic integrity? Ethical decisions? <laughs> yeah. I make more honest lists. What do you mean? Like, you're, like, let's say a fan says something that you don't agree with internally, and you're like, oh, well, I guess I should do that. Oh, I don't. I don't ever say I don't agree with. Um, a lot of times I try to, well, I try to do more now. That, so I'm a person who disagrees with everything a lot, very quickly. If I feel strongly about it, I'm trying to be more conscious of that because sometimes. If enough fans are saying something like you're saying, then I will realize, oh, I'm probably wrong. Like if enough fans, like, Shotgun Farmers in the very first version didn't have one, many guns. And a lot of people were being like, this game's getting kind of boring, with one gun, you should have more. And I was like, no, you're wrong, you're so wrong, it's my artistic choice, you should only have one gun. Then I had a sniper gun, and it was a way better game. So if there's enough magic people saying it, then I try to realize that maybe there's something wrong here. Uh, whereas if there's just some people saying it, or, some people, or if there's one person who's really passionate about it, then I'm just like, I see it, I hear you, these are the reasons I can't do it. If you want to hear that, then either reform the game or maybe from the community. But yeah. so I still try to keep my artistic integrity unless I realize it's something that maybe it's I'm realizing isn't what is wrong. How how did you gauge when you had something like you had that special sauce where you're like you I assume you prototyped, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like did you have people play it and got feedback and yeah. it was like, hey, like is this thing does this does this feel like something that you that you play? Did you do a like, User testing with your friends, mm -hmm. or, or just with like that's what your community is for—a small group. But you, you have that until you have that thing to offer community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my, my work how, do you, how do you gauge that? My workflow personally is to try to get something playable as fast as possible, and again, in front of people as quickly as possible. So I don't play who's staying behind the scenes for too long. I did that a little bit too much with my first game too. Uh, this game especially because I was making it live in front of an audience and stuff. Uh, so I'll just be like, hey, play it now. And so with Chocolate Fire, Game Jam is also my answer to that. You know, I try to make all my stuff during Game Jam. My first game was during Game Jam. All my in-between potential projects were made at Game Jam. Chocolate Fire was made during a Game Jam that I hosted myself. I fake a Game Jam just to make the game. Um, so it was a seven-day long Game Jam uh, that I did with other people in my community. And so I made the game and then forced myself to then make a vertical slice in that period of time. And I highly recommend this. Like, instead of being like, I have this great game idea, I'm going to work on it for six months. Like, make it playable. Give it to someone or give it to 20 people if one person is not enough. If enough of them don't say it's not fun, then you have a problem. Like the, I, I personally believe that uh, uh, if your game is playable with just crappy art and gray box and, 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 and you know, garbage graphics, if you go having fun, then you, you know, that's, that's when you know you might have a really good game on your hands uh, if you're going to carry that on. Wow. So I made the game in seven days, or I made a really, really, really bad version of it. Um, and uh, we played it together, it was online, so a bunch of us got together and played it and actually had fun. And we knew it was missing so many things and it was buggy and you could just camp out in, in places and kill people easily, but we were having a fun time, and so like, really that's the key. If you can have fun in that crappy prototype, then you can have fun in the middle of the yeah. Oh, and also making it look fun. Not just have fun, but fun playing it, but making it look fun. So the biggest thing about the first game is it doesn't look fun to play. And I didn't realize this until um, the YouTuber Funhouse made a video of the game. Literally, the other guy playing the game was like, I don't understand what's happening on the screen. And I was like, oh, this probably answers your question too. That's what's wrong with it, is it doesn't look fun, it just stuff's happening. I know what's happening, yeah. people who play the game know what's happening, but a video of it doesn't look fun. Whereas like, uh, if you look at all the games that have been selling well, if you look at a video of Stardew Valley, you know what it is, this is Harvest Moon, this is what you're getting. Yeah. So your game needs to look like what you're, you're Do you describe that in like, 
comments the video. It's like here, or while you're playing it, you're doing like kind of like a you're directing it. You're saying this. No, no, I, I don't. So I believe it's saying nothing at all. I just try to listen or look at the faces and stuff. Or if they're on, I check more. If they're out, for case testing online, bring on voice channels to hear what they're saying. But yeah, I try to direct it. Yeah. No, what I meant is that when you're playing it, like say say you're doing a video, you're, like, you're playing a oh sure, sure. Sure. If you're playing it, you know what's happening. But like you said, people don't mm -hmm. watching. You might not grasp why why there's no like, why the feet are not connected to the lake. Do you have like you describe that while you're playing it so that it makes more sense to people because they they can't play it and feel it. Right, right. It, to them, it's just it's just like this nebulous kind of like yeah. Thing. So that is a lot of, a lot of time that's called like a one-on-one -on -one trailer where you like well, like AAA games are really describing the gameplay mechanics. The problem with that is people only care about that if they already care about the game first. So if you're having to do that, then you probably have a problem because your game doesn't want fun. Uh, which I don't think doesn't mean that a game like that can't exist or can't do well. It's just that it's just really hard to sell those games right now. So it's just not the kind of games that I focus on. Is there ever a time when it's too early to show something? Like, I personally like, believe no. Not I mean, don't it. show it if you're not. So I started a game last year on stream, and I worked on it for a month, and then I came up with this game idea, and I switched over, yeah. and then someone else launched Kickstarter for the exact same game idea. So in some cases that's too early, but. It was only too early that I didn't keep working on it. If I kept working on it, I would have beat that Kickstarter out. I mean, it's fine. Kickstarter failed and that game was not good. Uh, so I'll be able to make it again in the future. But it was only too early if you're going to abandon the project because then you're now it's up to grabs for anyone else. But otherwise, I don't think so. I mean, your first sketch, don't show anyone that. Your first document about writing on the game, don't show anyone that. But the first thing you show your game is when you have something playable on stream. Like, my, my character's moving around. Like, start going audience there. There's so many viral Instagram posts of just, Look, I got my character walking in Unity, but it looks really cool. It looks like Mario 64. People are like, I want to play this game, and they fall off. Yeah. So, um, you know what you said about uh, people uh, with localizing? Uh, what about localizing with different game systems? I know like, you don't have a launch party and all the other stuff, but like, localizing to like, a Wii shop or like, PlayStation uh, 4 shop. Or that localizing just means uh, translating. I think we're talking about like, porting to consoles. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying like the some people are more like, oh, I'm an Xbox guy, or I'm a mm -hmm. PS4 guy. Sure. Um, like you're localizing to that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's dumb. I mean, there's gamers on every platform, and so you can just make more money by selling more. Are you planning on doing that too? Or? Yeah. Okay. I've had Xbox Dev Space for five years, and I've done anything about that much. It's much the cold business, man. But two of them. Everybody wants them. Okay, cool. All right. Any other questions? Thanks, guys.